Hello everyone and welcome to SE6046 Advanced Inorganic Chemistry, your final year hit of inorganic chemistry and this is lecture one with, uh, with me Gavin Hazel. So most of my final year inorganic chemistry content then is going to be related to the F block, that strange block of elements that's found right at the bottom of the periodic table and are often forgotten then in, in sort of secondary school and introductory inorganic chemistry courses. And they're composed of two sets of elements, the lanthanoids and the actinoids, and are uh, defined, if you like, by a progressive filling of the 4f orbitals for the lanthanoids and the 5f orbitals for the actinoids. Some of them are, are quite heavy elements, some of them have nuclei which are inherently unstable, so they are radioactive, and it makes for quite a rich and interesting set of chemistries, and of course a fairly wide array of applications that extends right the way from applications in the biomedical industry, from uh, imaging, uh, cancer patients and that kind of thing, through to the well-known applications of the radioactive elements in uh, nuclear chemistry. I would like to, to start simple today, really, and just consider what we actually mean by these lanthanoid and actinoid elements and try and develop an understanding of a, a definition for these elements. And I'd like to discuss some of the, the relativistic effects for heavy elements such as the actinoids and this this is quite prevalent in the actinoids and uh, really differentiates them in terms of their chemistry from the lanthanoids. Of course relativistic effects are also present in heavy atoms such as gold as well but we'll, we'll focus our discussions on, on the, the F block. And finally, then, I'd like to understand the electron configurations of the actinoids and the lanthanoids. Now, when you're filling progressively the 4f and the 5f orbitals, one might imagine that the, the electron configurations start to become quite complicated. And of course, this can be the case. So you'll remember right back to the first year when we looked at crystal field theory and we looked at the chemistry of the D block. And we focused our discussions on the first row of the transition series. I asked you in that module to recall or be able to recall the electron configurations of the first row of the D block. And indeed, it's helpful when we're considering models of bonding in the D block. So it's, it was very helpful in rationalising the way in which D block metals bond through crystal field theory, for example. You will be uh, relieved to know that this year I'm not going to ask you to recall the electron configurations of the F block, but I do want you to have an understanding of these electron configurations. And I do want you to, to have an understanding of where the anomalies are. So, for example, if there is a, a, a particular energetic advantage of having a, a half filled F subshells, for example, I would like you to be able to explain uh, where, where that occurs. OK, so what about an elemental postcode? Where are, where are we actually talking about in the periodic table? Well, we define elements 57 through to 71 as the lanthanoids, and we define elements 89 through to 103 as the actinoids. They actually slot in right at the bottom of the transition series there, but they're, all, they're uh, often presented as a separate block in the periodic table known as the F block because they have electrons in their F orbitals, their 4F and 5F orbitals. Now the lanthanoids, the, sorry, the lanthanoids, that's lanthanum through to lutetium, are the elements in which going from left to right, the 4F orbitals are progressively filled. Lanthanum, lanthanum doesn't actually have any 
electrons in its f orbitals. So the f electrons start at cerium and go right the way through to a complete 4f subshell at lutetium. Similarly, then in the actinoid, going from left to right, the 5f orbitals are progressively filled. And once again, actinium through to Lorentium. Actinium doesn't actually have any 5f orbitals. The filling of the 5f subshell starts at thorium and goes right the way through to Lorentium. And you can think of them really as analogues of that D, D transition series of metals that we looked at in the first year. When we go from scandium through to zinc in the first row of the transition series, the 3D subshell is progressively filled. Well, that's exactly what's going on here, except when we talk about the F block, we're talking about the 4F and the 5F subshells being progressively filled as we move from left to right across the periodic table. So unsurprisingly then, the reason why they're called the F elements or the F block is because of this progressive filling of the 4F and 5F orbitals. And it's sometimes found in textbooks that yttrium is often uh, discussed with these or in conjunction with these elements. And that's because yttrium has quite a similarity in terms of its chemistry to some of the lanthanoids. And indeed, it does occur naturally alongside quite a few of them. So we may see as we progress throughout the module a, discuss, a discussion of the chemistry of yttrium as well. Uh, and you may see in, in textbooks that the, the chemistry of yttrium is discussed alongside these elements. So let's develop the, the definition further. Let's consider the IUPAC definition of the lanthanoids, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. As I said, the lanthanoids run from lanthanum through to lutetium, the first row of that F block series. And the definition of the lanthanoids here recognizes the fact that lanthan lanthanum with the electron configuration shown there, doesn't actually have any 4f electrons or any electrons in its 4f orbitals, but is essentially a prototype for the elements that follow in which that 4f subshell is progressively filled. The actinoids then similarly uh, similar to the lanthanoids, but now we're talking about the 5F subshell, actinium through to lorentium. And again, those, those 5F orbitals are progressively filled. Now, you may see in some uh, textbooks a slightly older definition. Generally, we refer to these elements in, in, in the, the, the modern uh, textbooks as the lanthanoids and the actinoids. And they, again, um, recognise the fact that lanthanum and actinium are kind of precursors to these elements in which the 4F and 5F subshells, subshells are, are filled. You may see in the textbook then that some of these elements are referred to as the lanthanides and actinides. And this takes a, a bit more of a um, specific definition of these elements and only includes those that have electrons in their 4F and 5F orbitals. So cerium through to lutetium for the lanthanoids and thorium through to lorentium for the actinides. But for this, the purposes of this course, we will be discussing the lanthanoids and the actinoids. Just a little bit of uh, historical perspective then. Uh, uranium and thorium are the only two actinoids that occur naturally in significant quantities. And um, they were the first F elements to be isolated. Uranium was discovered by Martin Heinrich Klaproth, who was, uh, I believe, dissolving uh, pitch blend, so a uranium ore in nitric acid and he managed to precipitate out sodium diurinate and eventually isolate the element uranium. And that was back in 1789. 
And Jons Jakob Berzelius was the discoverer of thorium in 1829. And this, there's more to this story in that I believe the, the mineral in which thorium occurs uh, significantly and naturally was found on an island in, in, in Sweden by a, a member of the clergy who passed this mineral to his father, who was a mineralogist. For identification his father confirmed that it was a new mineral but he didn't know what to do with it so he passed it to Jons Jakob Berzelius who was a, a chemist who managed to to confirm the uh, the new mineral but also to isolate the new element thorium so there's often more to these stories than than you first see Interestingly, then, the discovery of these first two actinides actually predates the discovery of all of the lanthanides. And these were discovered between 1839, where cerium was the first of the lanthanides to be discovered, and 1945, where promethium was the, the last of the, uh, the lanthanides to be discovered. So all of these elements have absolutely wonderful names. Now, any kind of detailed investigations of, of F element chemistry didn't really begin until the mid 20th century. And this is because of uh, the, the technical difficulties that were associated with the, the separation and the isolation of the elements. So these, you know, these are often found in, in, in rock ores, in mineral ores, and the elements themselves are very difficult to separate and isolate on their own. And anybody who's read about the work of Marion Pierre Curie, or, or perhaps you've even seen the recent movie Radioactivity, which I would definitely recommend, which uh, looks at the life of Marie Curie, anybody who's watched that or read about that can understand some of the difficulty in isolating these elements. You've often got to boil up very toxic and dangerous radioactive material in, in very, very concentrated and corrosive acids and then undergo um, a series of quite tricky fractionation experiments in which you eventually isolate very small quantities of the element in question. And of course, to get those quantities, to get any meaningful quantities of these elements, which one can work with and experiment upon, you need to start often with tons of very uh, dangerous radioactive ore. Elements themselves then are all very electropositive and they tarnish quite rapidly in air. Generally, the, 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 the elemental um, lanthanides on their own show a, a hexagonal close packed or a cubic close packed structure. And at room temperature, a body centered, uh, sorry, at room temperature and at high temperatures, a body centered cubic structure. That's unsurprising. Most metals show that kind of structure. Uh, the actinide structures are, are much more complex with a lot of um, allotropic phases that, that change with temperature. So I think I, I believe it's uh, plutonium that has something like six different allotropic phases um, at, at, at near ambient temperatures. So small changes in temperature can, can cause a, a modification in the crystal structure of that element. So it gets quite complex. Uh, with the actinides. Okay, so what I want to talk about is some one of the, the, the odder aspects of F element chemistry and the role that relativity plays in their chemistry. And you might be surprised to be sat on a, a, a chemistry degree and hear the word relativity that's usually something we associate with, with physicists. And indeed, we usually associate relativistic effects with systems on an astronomical scale. So Einstein certainly, at the beginning at least, wasn't talking about subatomic particles. He was talking about very large moving bodies. But it's also found that relativity can apply to the atomic scale. 
and uh, the, the field of relativistic quantum mechanics is a, a burgeoning field as we discover more and more about life on the subatomic scale. And these relativistic effects then become much more pronounced or more important for the heavier elements. And this also applies to those heavy elements at the bottom of the F block, such as the actinoids. So let's start by considering a, a, a simple system, an electron in the 1s orbital. We can show how the relativistic mass of an electron increases according to its speed, or rather it increases as an electron moves faster. We can show that by consideration of the following equation in which the, the m is shown uh, as the, the, the relativistic mass of an electron, m0 is the resting mass of an electron, c is the speed of light, and nu there is the velocity of the electron. Now, we can model that equation and we can plot the relativistic mass of an electron versus the velocity of that electron. What it shows us is that the, for, for a small velocity, when an electron is traveling at relatively low velocities, its relativistic mass is low. However, when the velocity of that electron approaches the speed of light, the relativistic mass goes to infinity. Now, you note there that uh, the axis on the velocity of the electron there is zero to the speed of light. We would never anticipate that an electron would travel at the speed of light. Uh, but if it approaches the speed of light or travels at a significant fraction of the speed of light, then its relativistic mass will increase. Now, that doesn't, if we go back to our high hydrogen 1s electron doesn't really matter because in hydrogen we've just got one proton and one electron and the coulombic attraction between the proton and the electron is such that the uh, the electron doesn't ever reach speeds approaching the speed of light or even a significant fraction of the speed of light but as nuclei become larger and there are more protons in the nucleus and a greater degree of effective nuclear charge and therefore a greater coulombic attraction between the nucleus and the electron. Electrons have got to travel at higher speeds and they've got to travel at higher velocities or speeds to avoid capture by the nucleus. And this is particularly prevalent for the 1s electron. So you imagine an electron in the 1s subshell of a very, very large element. It has to fight with a very, very large nucleus that has a high effective nuclear charge and is beckoning the electron for capture. But the electron must travel at greater velocities in order to avoid capture by the nucleus. Now it's found, and we'll see over the next couple of slides, slides that for heavier atoms, and again, particularly prevalent in the actinoid series, this speed can approach, but obviously not exceed, the speed of light. And again, this is particularly important for S electrons, which don't have any node at the nucleus. So unlike the P orbitals and the D orbitals that we've studied so far, these, uh, these new, these atomic orbitals, the s orbitals, don't have a node at the nucleus, so they've got to travel at high velocities to avoid capture. Clearly more of a problem for those atomic orbitals which are closer to the nucleus, like the 1s orbital. So this increase in velocity of the electron as the nuclei of atoms get larger, and therefore its demonstrable increase in relativistic mass has an implication for something that we call the Bohr radius of an atom. 
And just to, to note, the ball radius of an atom is a physical constant, and it's equal to the most probable distance between the nucleus and the electron in a hydrogen atom in its ground state. Really what we mean by that is that it's a measure of atomic radius. And we can measure the Bohr radius or calculate the Bohr radius according to the following equation. So A0 here is the Bohr radius. H with the funny little line going through there is the reduced Planck's constant, 2 pi over H. M0 is the resting mass of the electron. C is the speed of light. And alpha is something that physicists call the fine structure content. And this is related to the strength of electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. Really, we can, as chemists, we can think about this as a, a measure of the velocity of an electron, right? So we think about it as nucleus growing, effective nuclear charge is higher, greater columbic attraction between protons and electrons. The electron's got to travel faster in order to avoid capture by the nucleus. So for a 1s orbital of a hydrogen atom that has an orbiting radius of about 0.0529 nanometers, that fine structure content, alpha, is equal to 1 over 137. What that means for us as chemists is that that fine structure constant shows that that 1s electron is traveling at nearly 1 137th the speed of light. So hydrogen 1s electron traveling at a very tiny fraction of the speed of light, relativistic mass is low. Now, if we know that that hydrogen 1s electron travels at 1 137th the speed of light, we can think about extending this to atoms with a higher atomic number, to heavier atoms. And we can do that using the following equation in which we approximate the velocity of an electron. We take the radial velocity of an electron or our approximation for the radial velocity of an electron. And we say that that's equal to the atomic number, the speed of light, and divided by 137, and we get that number 137 from this fine structure content. So let's have a look at gold as an example. So for example, gold has an atomic number of 79, and when you plug the numbers into that equation, essentially you're just doing 79 over 137 here and keeping the speed of light as constant, which of course it is, we find that that is equal to 0.58. So what that shows us, that approximation shows us that the 1s electron in gold is traveling at around 58% of the speed of light. Now that's a darn sight quicker than the 1 137th the speed of light that the 1s electron is traveling in hydrogen. So you see there proof, physical proof of the notion that electrons in that 1s orbital travel faster for heavier elements, and it all comes down to this idea of them avoiding capture by the nucleus. Of course, if their velocity is higher, then we know that their relativistic mass is higher. Now, if we substitute the relativistic mass into that ball radius equation, we obtain an equation which demonstrates how the Bohr radius decreases as a function of relativistic effects. And I show you there a plot demonstrating that as the velocity of an electron increases, so does this, so this Bohr radius decreases, i.e. basically what we're saying is the atomic radius of the atom shrinks. Of course, we're not talking, we're not talking strictly about the atomic radius. We're talking about the Bohr radius, the most probable distance between the nucleus and the, the, the 1s electron, essentially. 
Now, you, you may sit there and say, but hang on a minute, we're talking about the F elements, but I thought this only applied to the 1S orbital. So how does that, how does that uh, impact these heavy elements? Well, what happens is as that electron speeds up and its relativistic mass increases, the 1S orbital contracts. And what this leads to is a contraction and stabilization of all s orbitals in order to, to, to maintain orthogonality. So essentially the one s orbital starts to contract and then all of the other s orbitals in the atom say well I'm going to follow suit and they contract and stabilize too. It also has an impact on p orbitals and they start to contract and stabilize. Now, as those S and P orbitals contract and they get closer to the nucleus, they become much more effective at screening the D and F orbitals. So this is where those relativistic effects start to, to, uh, to, to, to play their role in determining some of the chemistries of the F elements. So those S and P orbitals start to contract. They become better screeners, if you like, of the effective nuclear charge and the D and F orbitals don't experience or electrons in the D and F orbitals don't experience so much Coulombic attraction with the nucleus and of course the result of that is that the D and F orbitals in these heavier elements actually expand and destabilize and this has a significant impact on the chemistry of these materials. So the expansion of the D and F orbitals for these heavier elements means that these orbitals are more interested, if you like, or more available for some kind of covalent bonding. And it can have uh, impacts on the way in which they bond with ligands uh, and, and with other organic species. And this is a, a good example the 5F electrons of the actinoids are more weakly bound, i.e. they are more expanded and destabilized than the 4F electrons of the lanthanides, again, because of these relativistic effects. And that has very important impacts upon the chemistry of the actinoids when compared to the lanthanides i.e. these 5F electrons of the lanthanoids are, um, if you like, stretch out further from the nucleus and are more chemically active, more available for bonding. So what about the F orbitals themselves? Well, there are uh, seven possible magnetic quantum numbers for the F orbitals. The seven F orbitals have magnetic quantum numbers of zero, plus and minus one, plus and minus two, plus and minus three. The 4F and the 5F orbitals are the first and second sets of orbitals, respectively. And there's a general set of F orbitals that are shown there. Now you can see that they have lots of lobes, lots of nodes, and their structure is, is quite complicated. You will also remember that back in the first year, when we were looking at D block chemistry, I asked you to remember the structure and be able to recall the orientation of the 5D orbitals. That's not the case this year. These are, these are pretty complex and I'm not going to ask you to draw these. But I'd like you to have an appreciation of them. Now, if you look at the radial distribution functions of the F orbitals, then we can already see the impact of these relativistic effects. So I show you here the radial distribution functions for the valence orbitals of samarium 3 plus. Samarium sits in the lanthanoids and plutonium 3 plus. Plutonium sits in the actinoids. And I'd like you to focus on the red distribution function there, the red 
radial distribution function, which is for the 4f orbital of samarium and the 5f orbital of plutonium. Now, for samarium and for the, the, most of the lanthanoids, the 4f orbitals are essentially core orbitals. They have very little interaction with any surrounding crystal field. And you'll remember crystal field theory from the first year, i.e. they're not that available for bonding. We wouldn't count them in any model of bonding. You will see then that this is completely different for the 5f orbitals of an actinoid element, in this case plutonium. Because of those relativistic effects, those 5f orbitals are expanded and destabilized and have a greater radial extent than the 4f orbitals. And this means that those 5f orbitals are much more willing to take part in some kind of covalent bonding with a ligand. And it has quite profound implications for the difference between the organometallic chemistry of the actinoids versus the lanthanoids. So a final look now at the electron configurations of these elements. And I show you below there the electron configurations for the lanthanoids. Uh, the, the gas phase atoms, so if you like the electron configuration as you see in the periodic table, and also their three plus ions, and the lanthanoids like to sit largely in the three plus state if they can. And you'll see that it's quite similar to the first row of the D block, but this time we're just talking about F electrons. There is a progressive filling of the 4F orbitals, which follows an entirely regular pattern almost as you cross the periodic table. There is an irregularity at gadolinium, and uh, just like the irregularities as you fill the D subshell going across the transition series, this reflects the stability of having a half filled shell. In this case, the, uh, the electron configuration of gadolinium has an increased stability uh, for having a, a 4F7 configuration. The electron configurations of the actinoids is slightly different, and you can see, at, at least at the early stages or the early uh, part of the series, you can see that there's a, a difference in the actinoids when you compare them to the lanthanoids. And that difference is most pronounced in going from thorium through to neptunium. And I, I start at thorium here because it's the first one to have some F electrons. Uh, you see that the 6d orbitals of thorium to neptunium are very close in energy to the 5f orbitals. And what this results in is that uh, the 6d orbitals are in fact occupied. This changes then at plutonium right the way through to nobelium, where the 5f orbitals now become lower in energy compared with the 60 orbitals. And then from plutonium through to nobelium, the series essentially follows the same patterns of the lanthanoids, but in this case, there is the progressive filling of the 5f orbitals. Okay, so I think that's enough for our first lecture. The lanthanoids and actinoids are heavy elements found at the bottom of the periodic table. Relativistic effects can have implications for their chemical reactivity and their electron configurations involve the 4f and 5f orbitals. Thank you very much.